come into your house and lift your name on high. For trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ our King. The Son of Heaven has rose again. And we worship a living and active God. Lord, we just thank you that we can come here and we just ask your spirit to fill this place this morning as we continue to, in a time of worship, Lord. We thank you for the words that you have given to Pastor Jim for us this morning, Lord. May, may they convict us and help us to grow in a closer walk with you today. We ask these things and give you praise in one, Jesus Christ's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Let us continue to sing about our good God, the goodness of God. Your mercy never fails me. All my days I have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Jesus, the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Thank you, Lord. Give up my dream. 
Lord, just ask that you just continue to prepare our hearts for the word that you have for us here now from Jim, Lord. We thank you for his ability to just read and understand your word with your spirit with him, Lord, and just we just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. Kids, you may be dismissed. And thank you, Pastor Jim. I love those kids. Lemonade, lemonade. There's also cookies out there, by the way. So you want to get in on those cookies. I am so glad you're here this morning. And uh, I'm sorry, we're getting this fixed out. All right. But uh, I want to, as we get started, about two or three announcements. First of all, uh, we do have a meeting, as Pastor Dan mentioned in his, if you see him today, he has kind of a nice outfit on, by the way. But uh, anyway, uh, we have a meeting right after church. I'm going to tell a little more about the sermon, but uh, that's announcement one. Announcement two is my brother, Michael, and his wife, Carrie, are here visiting from the great Northwest. Uh, yeah, good to have them. And I only have one request, and that is please do not ask him any stories from our childhood. Okay? Yeah, there's a reason I passed her this far from where I grew up. Okay? So I... I did a memorial service yesterday for uh, Mike Luce's, or be Coach Luce's granddad, uh, Mr. Clyde Reed, 102 years old. And people during the service, the family spoke a little bit and they kept saying things like, I can't tell you that story in this setting. And so you can't hear his stories in this setting, okay? All right, thank you so much. Yeah, okay, and so, yeah, anyway. But uh, still a little more feedback. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something else too before we get into the sermon. I'm gonna invite up a couple of different couples. First of all, I'm gonna bring up uh, Tom and Becky Williams. So Tom and Becky, would you mind coming on up this morning? I want to introduce you to this couple uh, just to let you know them a little better. Uh, Tom and Becky, some things about them. First of all, uh, just a tidbit of information. Tom is a pastor. Now he's told me he's retired. Uh, not because he wants to, but because of health reasons, because of heart issues you've had, is it eight heart procedures? So, so the doctor just basically said, you need to just not preach and pastor. But that doesn't limit the gifts that God has given him. I'm going to share that with you in a minute. They pastored the church. If you all know where the Forest Park Church of the Nazarene is, they were the pastors of that church. <clears throat> and over time, as God was releasing him from ministry, and this all happened with Forest Park to buy that property. Uh, they were the pastors of that church. So it's just a small world. Yeah. And, and the connection also is that you are good friends with a guy named Dave Lambert, right? Okay. <laughs> but I had, I had reached out to her and said, I'd love to talk with you sometime. And Tom called me and said, hey, I'd, I'm happy to come by and visit. And we spent about an hour or so in the office one day. And I just, there are three things that he told me that day that just, warmed my heart greatly, not only his ministry that continues, although it's not behind a pulpit. Uh, he has a heart for marriage mentors, which I just love that so much. That is so, so needed, and we're going to talk more about that in the future. He has a heart for Celebrate Recovery, which is another valuable, valuable ministry. And the third thing is he has a heart for and has been involved with Financial Peace University and Dave Ramsey. So these are all like three things that I'm just like, as he was talking, I said, I, I had to almost, I'm honest, I almost had to pinch myself <laughs> because those are like three big things that are desperately needed right now yeah. in the life of the church. Yeah. So needed in the life of the church. And I'm grateful to God that you have those calls on your life, that call in your life. And then uh, you are just his cohort, uh, yeah. uh, Becky. I'm the behind the scenes. You're behind the scenes, yeah. <laughs> and, and you work, where do you work at? Um, I work at IU Health Ball. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. So okay. Outpatient. Yeah, I need to do just a minute. Okay, all right. Is there anything you want to share? This? Either one of y'all just want to share something? I mean, I've kind of explained um, a little bit about you. <laughs> if, okay. Uh, don't believe what Dave tells you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, we've been, I've been a minister now since 1987. Mm -hmm. So a couple days. So, uh, mm -hmm. but we've, we've only been married 35 years, so we're still le learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but we love yeah. marriage. Yeah. We love, we've worked with uh, Celebrate Recovery and uh, 
we've worked with Financial Peace. We are not rich or anything, but we're uh, debt free. Mm -hmm. sure. So, you know, that's a blessing. Sure. Um, sure. Amen. So, uh, but uh, we, we want to serve. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So just get to know these folks, Tom and, and Becky Williams. And I, just go ahead and stand up here. I'm going to invite up Natalie Presley. Natalie, were you here this morning? I thought I saw Natalie come in. Yeah, come on up, Natalie. Why don't you bring your daughter with you? We'll just, we'll just embarrass her. <laughs> I promise we will not embarrass her. You can just tell us her name. We'll have you stand up on this side, okay? Now, we're not taking these folks into membership yet, but, but we just want to introduce you to them and let you know a little bit about them. So Natalie comes to us from another Nazarene church, and you have uh, been involved a little bit in ministry, right? You want to tell us a little about some of the things you've done? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, okay. So you, I mean, you've helped with children, you've helped with youth, you've just been involved in the life of the church. So, and she started coming about, what was it, about six, eight weeks ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and your daughter is? Cheyenne. Cheyenne, that's <laughs> right. And you have another daughter who Erica. went to the Ninja Club. Yeah. Erica, okay. So we're just grateful to have you all with us and, and excited about how God, uh, I know God has put ministry on your heart as well. So we want to do what we can. I just want to see, have you see their faces because they, we just want them to be, you know, just feel like you're part of us. Even if you're not members yet, you're still welcome as part of our family. So I'd like to go ahead and just pray for these two couples, and we'll just continue on in the sermon. Jesus, today I thank you for the way your hand is at work. And, Lord, we don't ever assume that uh, we have it all figured out. We're, we're still learning. And as Tom talked about his years in ministry, it, it's the same in my life. As they talked about their years of marriage and I'm sure Natalie would testify in life, just the words, we're still learning. But Lord, we're grateful when you shine upon us to bring uh, wonderful godly people through these doors. Uh, not only in these pews, they're all here, but, but these couples we just highlight this morning. And we just pray that as we get to know them, that you would deepen our connection in Jesus. And that, Father, you would help them to feel welcome. And that, Father, you would help them to feel, um, I guess you'd say, your hand continually on their lives, even after eight uh, heart procedures, uh, ministry continues. And Father, we just ask your blessing on them and help us as family to embrace them, to encourage them, to support them, to love them, to pray for them. And we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up and letting me visit with you tonight. This morning. All right, let's, we'll just, let's get a clap. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and have a seat. Thanks. All right, that's good. Cheyenne was ready to go. Hey, Jeanette, sure. Amen. You know, as Jerry uh, is in heaven, he doesn't miss any of us, does he? He really doesn't. Because as soon as he stepped over, after he breathed his last and stepped over, uh, he was not only ready, uh, he was, and, and Jerry is one of those guys, and I'm not going to spend much time here, but whenever I talk to him and I'd ask him how you're doing, he said, fantastic. And now the last few years, after several back surgeries, his tune changed a little bit. But, uh, but I always appreciate that. And I just know that when he went to heaven, there were no more back problems. And he was totally excited. And the word fantastic didn't start to describe what he saw there. So, but thanks for sharing, Jeanette. We really, we really do need each other. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans 12, 12. But we're going to back up just to begin in the first chapter of Joshua. Because I want to just look at one more time what we talked about last Sunday, just for a minute and then jump into the New Testament. In Joshua chapter 1, Moses has died. In fact, that's what Joshua just writes down as God tells him to write it down. Moses is dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. And now it's time for you to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. 
And so that was the mandate that came to him. And if you read through Joshua chapter one, again and again, the Lord says these words, be strong and courageous. In fact, I think the last time he said it, he says, be strong, very strong and very courageous. I mean, he just, it's like that emphasis that, that you just need to be ready for what I'm about to do. So uh, last week, we were talking about Memorial Day. We were remembering the children of Israel crossing over into the promised land. We talked about our military. And by the way, today is D-Day. So uh, thinking about the thousands upon thousands who lost their lives in just one day, securing the beginning of securing our freedom over in uh, Europe. So we remember those men. And then today also the people, we talked about this last week, the people who poured into us. And uh, that's, to me, that's why I'm here today. My brother and I could testify, and, and all of you could testify, of godly people who poured into our lives. Neighbors, uh, youth group leaders, teachers, others, who, who, who parents, grandparents, who, who were examples for us to get where we are today. None of us just got here by accident. Somebody somewhere prayed for us. Somebody somewhere visited us, reached out to us, and, and we're here. because. And so we honored that last Sunday. We, we talked about that. But we're going to get into Joshua uh, this morning for a few minutes and then jump into chapter 12 of Romans. In chapter 1, it was time to cross the Jordan. Now, nobody had really remembered what that was like except Joshua and Caleb. Now, they knew stories. Family members had shared because of their family, their relatives, and others that had crossed over in from the Red Sea and, and started this journey, but now they're here at the Jordan at flood stage, getting ready to cross into the promised land. So that was the first thing we saw. And then I love what we saw last week, this statement that says this, I will give you every place you set your foot. Now, to me, that means several things. Let me just give you two right away. First of all, it gives me confidence that God is with me that where if I'm in Jesus, that wherever I go, he is going with me. And it gives me confidence that when I face some very tough times, because there's times in my life, your life, if we're doing great things for God, we're going we're gonna to step into some dark places. We're going to step into some very oppressive places. We're going to step into some very difficult places. But I just had to give you that verse one more time where God just tells Joshua in Joshua 1, I will give you every place you step your foot. Now, Think about this too, the same thing, and I said this last week, when you go in the store, when you go in the post office, when you go in the bank, when you go into con cannons, oh, my brother and his wife showed up yesterday with a box of con cannon donuts. I mean, like that's, you can just move in and live with us now, okay? If you bring Pizza King, we'll let you have the master bath, you know? It's just, it's awesome. But anyway, everywhere, as followers of Jesus, everywhere we place our foot, he says, I will be with you. And something else he says is this, and listen carefully. No one will be able to stand up against you. You ever meet strangers? You ever have situations where you feel like people just are against you? I've had very few of those in my life, but I've been acquainted with folks that have lots of those. This is the reminder. We hear it in Joshua. We hear it again in the Gospel of John. As the Holy Spirit has promised, I will be with you. Here he is, guiding them into the promised land. And he tells them also in the Gospel of John. And then the last thing that we saw from this passage is keep this book on your lips. Are you in Scripture every day? Are you reading the Word? Is it, is it something that, uh, you know, is it something that continues to not just impress you, but challenge you? Is it something that continues to, maybe the Word would be enlighten you, give you strength? God told Joshua, before you get ready to go in the promised land, I want you to keep these things you're seeing, experiencing, these things I'm telling you, keep these on your lips. We have to be very aware of what we're listening to, what we're watching, what we're doing, because whatever goes in here will somehow get into here and end up coming out here. And what it's, what's on my lips? On my lips. So let's move on. Now, the scripture for today, that was in Joshua. We'll go back to Joshua 4, maybe. I don't know for sure. But anyway, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Let's go on to uh, uh, Romans 12, 12, okay? The reason I look at this scripture today is because, to me, it parallels. Last week in Sunday school, we were talking about when you go through tough times, and I was reminded, and the word was tribulation, but in this translation, it calls it affliction. 
And I thought about that. And of course, in class, I'm always either on uh, Safari or Bible Hub. I mean, something state of, I want to check that out in scripture. I want to check that out in the original language. I want to see what other versions, how they translate it and how they you know, interpret it. And so anyway, I was looking at that and that just hit me last Sunday. I'm like, this ties in. And I obviously wasn't going to talk about it last Sunday in church, but over the week, it's just been ruminating. Come back. And, and I want us to read just this part in the middle here. Okay. Would you read this with me? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, persistent in prayer. We'll just skip the constant because it means the same thing. Let's say it again. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, persistent in prayer. Now, this week I did a little thing on Facebook. I said, what do you think of when you hear 12s? Because to me, it was like, there's got to be a sermon here, Romans 12, 12. Let's talk about 12s. So I asked different people on Facebook what it comes to your mind when you think of 12. Pastor Dan said this, 12 inches is a foot. There are 12 Hunger Game districts. There are uh, football players that have 12 on their jersey. Uh, he told me two guys, I've heard of these guys, a Tom Brady and a Terry Bradshaw. Uh, I was also thinking of another guy that my son-in-law would be so excited to hear his name, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, I was thinking of Roger Staubach, Bob Greasy, Andrew Luck, Andrew Cunningham, Ken Stabler, uh, yeah, Jim Kelly. People said uh, a dozen eggs. Fritz added the 12 days of Christmas and 12 notes in music. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Trish Stoop said that her mom would get this number 12 out of 13 children. There are 12 months in a year, 12 disciples. I thought of this one, 12 donuts. A pastor friend of mine said 12 drummers drumming. And then there's one sport. I looked this up online. There's one sport that requires 12 players, and it's women's lacrosse, women's lacrosse. But I wanted to share this, and I wish so much that Darcy was here this morning, because there was at one point a time in Ohio State football his, history when there were 12 players on the field. Does anybody remember that with Coach Woody Hayes? Yeah, he was the 12th man in a football game when he came up and slugged a player from the opposite team, and he immediately retired at that point. So there's another 12, okay? There's another 12, Ohio State, absolutely. Okay, now I want to take and give you a word picture here out of Romans 12, 12, and just keep thinking about these verses that say joyful in hope, persistent in affliction, persi patient in affliction, persistent in prayer. 12, 12, and I want to add another 12. And I want to talk to you today about a fertilizer that I remember as a kid growing up, it was called 12, 12, 12. That was that fertilizer that you would put on your yard. And so I did a little research and I double checked with uh, my good farmer friend. I have several good farmer friends, but I happened to have him in Sunday school this morning, uh, Bill Whitehead. I said, Bill, I got to ask you a question about this 12, 12, 12, okay? I want to make sure I got this right because anything you read on the internet can be bogus, okay? That, that's one of the things that you have to, the whole fact checking, you have to fact check the fact checkers. And so I'm on there, I'm like, okay, I think this is what it says. And here's, here's, here's what the 12, 12, 12 stands for. Okay, you ready? Nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. Now, as I checked with one of these lawn gurus, they told me that nitrogen is the single most important nutrient to add to a lawn. Nitrogen allows grass to grow green, beautiful green foliage. The same lawn guru said this, phosphorus is also essential, but it's essential for a different reason, and that's for healthy Roots. Am I tracking okay so far? Farmer friends, we doing okay? All right, so far. All right. And then potassium, and I love it because I mentioned this to Kay in Sunday school. She goes, yeah, MPK. MPK. Oh, yeah, potassium. That's it's K on the, on the uh, uh, chart there, element chart. Potassium is the nutrient that is most responsible for the overall health of the plant, enabling it to withstand the bad weather. Okay, so you got the nitrogen that greens it up, the phosphate that helps the roots go down, and the potassium, the potassium that helps it weather the storm. All three of those that are in this thing called 12, 12, 12. Now, we'll come back to that word picture. But in Romans 12, Paul is giving us this, this lengthy letter that he's written. And, and it's probably one of his most deep theological letters that he shares. And he basically covers it all from chapter 1, describing the days in which we live and how we have to understand that it's the power of the gospel that matters more than anything early on in chapter one of Romans. 
And, and then he goes into chapter two and three. He's like, there's none of us that are righteous enough to do this alone, to do this as the exclusive spokesman for the Bible. And by the time you get into chapter two and three, he reminds us that Jesus is the only one that can make us, you know, what this Bible wants us to be. He's the only one that can carry it out through us. And he reminds us in chapter three that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In chapter four and five, he starts to put together this plan that God has for salvation by faith through Christ. And all these things come together. And by the time you get to chapter 12, he's like, these are the bullet points for your life in Jesus. In verse one and two, about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then about verse nine through 21, he just lays out point, point, point. Uh, this is how Christians should behave. Now, I encourage you. I've given you a lot of stuff here today. I would encourage you to go back in Romans 12 and look through verses 9 through 21 and just say, what do those mean to me? Starts off with, you know, uh, the fact of, of cling to what is good, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, and then just goes on. Boom, 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 boom. In verse 12, I love these three things. And the first one is this, rejoice in hope. Spent some time with the Luz family this week talking about preparing for Mr. Reed's funeral. And I said, you know what we need more than anything? And by the way, this gentleman, 102 years old, was born on the same date as Dr. Billy Graham. So it was pretty cool because he said all through his life he had, he had tracked Dr. Graham, had several of his books and such. But the very same date of Dr. Graham's birth on November 7th back in 1918. If you can think about that, our church was one year old. And in 1918, Woodrow Wilson was president. Crazy. 19 different presidents. But anyway, I go back to this thing that I just talked to the family. I said, you know, this is a time where we need to talk about hope. And obviously for us as followers of Jesus, it is hope in Jesus. It's not hope that the market goes well. It's not hope that when I go to the doctor for a checkup, everything's okay. It's not hope that I get in my car and it's going to get me from here to there. It's this hope that is in Jesus. And you dig a little deeper. It's this hope that's in the cross of Christ. It's this hope, this hope in God's word being true, every single word being true, the promises that can't be broken, our hope that's built on the cross of Jesus. So that's the first. The, thing, the second thing is this, is being patient in tribulation. To wait patiently in our suffering without murmuring is what one of the commentators says. I don't know about you, but I am not a patient person. I am that person that drives up to the drive through at McDonald's, and I gauge how many cars are in the drive through versus how many cars are in the parking lot, quickly decide whether it's faster to go in and just order. I don't know if you do that. Now, Chick-fil-A has helped me a lot with their drive through over the last year. Quite a system they have. But the writer Paul says to be patient in tribulation, to be of good cheer, knowing that our strength that we have with God giving us the strength is going to help us through every situation, every difficulty in life. Listen to that. Carefully listen to that. Tribulation will come. I do not believe that God is the orchestrator of tribulation. I don't think he is like hiding behind a corner, waiting for you to, 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 you know, to trip up so he can just pop out and say, I told you so, I told you so. I was having a discussion with a, a friend of mine on Instant Messenger, and he and I are on different sides of the political spectrum. And his statement to me was, as we were winding it up, he said, I just hope that at the end of this conversation, one of us can say, I told you so. And he said, and I hope it's you. And I, I, I messaged him back, and I said, after 41 years of memory, or sorry, after 41 years of marriage, after 41 years of marriage, that phrase, I told you so, has been deleted from my vocabulary, okay? And it should be, if you haven't deleted it from yours, you need to right away, okay? That's just extra, and I'm not asking you to give for that. Uh, the third thing is this, to be constant in prayer. You know this, but listen, one of the chief weapons we have in life is prayer. Next Sunday night, Gary uh, Sheets is going to be here, and he's going to tell us about the, the, the event that took place out on Lake Erie when their boat, they were out on Lake Erie after midnight. And it's not unusual for Gary to fish after, you know, after midnight. And, and, but it was one of those nights when a storm that could have blown up really did blow up. 
and tossed their boat. And for an hour and a half, they were in, and you may try this sometime, just in a cup or a, a bowl of water. They were in 43 degree water for an hour and a half. That's something else. And God spared them. And Gary has a part of that story where they prayed and God literally moved. And the way he can verify this, I don't want to give you the whole detail, but he can verify this because it showed up on the tracking system of their fish finder. He had, a, he had the GPS on his fish finder. And later on when the boat was taken and they had tracked all that in what we call like a black box, if you will, they were able to find out at that moment when things changed and said, that's when we prayed. Prayer, one of the best weapons we have, not only to encourage us, but to hear God's voice. Praise, intercession, request, God's throne, being reminded that he truly is in charge and he truly wants to help us. Now, I want to bring this around and make application. And it's going to lead us to an altar call, which will lead us to our gathering as soon as we're done. 12, 12, 12. As I was thinking about this in Sunday school last Sunday, and Sherry did a great job. Greg, Sherry did a great job. Please tell her I was listening, okay? And she did well. And as we were going through, I just started thinking 12, 12, 12, 12. And I was thinking 12, you. And I just started praying, even in the midst of that thinking, God, just give us 12, you. 12, you. And then I thought about this. What if we had 12 mentors who were invested in those 12 youth? I'm not just talking about prayer support. It could be parents, it could be aunts, uncles, it could be grandparents, it could be any of us in this room. What if we had 12 mentors who stepped up and said, I'm going to mentor each, you can pick one or you can just pair up part of the whole group, 12 mentors. You're going to come when the youth meet. You're going to be here to support them. You're going to be here to help lead studies. You're going to be here to, 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 to really just get involved. You're going to bring food. You're going to serve food. You're going to clean up. You're going to engage when the youth go out on a project to somebody's home to, to, to clean up brush or trash, or you're just a mentor to them. You may, even, you may even text them throughout the week and say, you know what, I'm praying for you today, and I just want you to know I'm thankful that you're part of our youth group. And then I thought about this, 12 youth, 12 mentors, and then 12 people covering the youth group in prayer. You say, Jim, I'm not able to get here when the youth meet. I'm not able to uh, be part of those programs. I'm, I already had somebody come to me last year and say, I want to be, I'm, I'm, I'm be in on this. You know, here was the deal. In Joshua chapter 4, when the children of Israel got ready to cross over, God told them exactly what was going to happen, and Joshua told the people. And he said, I want you to gather 12 leaders, one from each of the 12 tribes, and when the waters parted, and I don't even know how this worked, except God just did it. Because I've seen water part, and I, even when a lake recedes or a river recedes, there's still a bunch of debris. There's a bunch of wet, you know, bank there before it actually dries out days later, at least. But it said that when the Jordan parted, it was dry. And God told each of the leaders of the 12 leaders, pick up a stone and take it with you and carry these stones so that whenever we're through into the promised land, that will be a reminder to you of what happened here today what happened here today. And so in just a little bit, we're going to wind this down. And we need 12 youth, and they may not even be here this morning, but you can invite your friends. We need 12 mentors. And you know what this, too? The 12 mentors, they all they have to do is, they're interested in talking to a Tina yesterday, who's the grandmother of uh, Mackenzie, uh, who graduated. And she said, I feel bad she's, you know, she's not going to be in the youth group anymore. I said, ah, Mackenzie could be a mentor. You know, I got those names right, didn't I? <laughs> I didn't call you Bob, okay? So anyway, but anyway, uh, although I did meet Bob's brother yesterday, and he had like a Cincinnati red shirt on and a Cincinnati hat, and he's like, who are you and why are you here? And, but anyway, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I have great respect for Reds fans and Cubs fans. So I do. I seriously do. But back to the sermon quickly. But 12 mentors. These can be parents. These can be other adults that are there and just on site. They get to see you and they know that these are people that really believe in this youth ministry. 12 mentors. And then 12 people covering in prayer. Uh, in just a few minutes, the altar call is going to be inviting you to come. Now, here's another thing too. It can be more 
than 12. You know, I, I'm going to invite my brother and his wife after we start walking up here and picking up these different rocks. They, they can pick them up and they can pray for us back in, in their state, Washington, Oregon, Washington, Washington, right? They live on the barrier. Okay, yeah, I just, but, but it just, I thought about this because when Joshua directed the people and they landed the promised land, they said, carry these with you as a reminder. Now, these different stones up here say different things. And since I ordered these from a place that is not necessarily like the uh, a Christian place, there may be some on there that, that say stuff like, I don't know. Uh, this one says uh, success. You know, well, we can pray for success over the youth. This one says laugh. It's good to laugh. And, and now that we're mostly not wearing masks, I expect more smiles in the sanctuary. This one says health. This one says and you cannot give this to anyone else, okay? This one says relax, okay? If you pick that one up, that's yours. But there's also trust, family, gratitude, wisdom, joy, all kinds of stones here. And pick one up that just kind of just connects with you. So what I'm going to ask for is 12 youth, 12 mentors, and 12 adults. And over time, we'll create a list, and you can sign up and say, I'm one of those 12. Because we want to pray for you as one of those 12. Now, let me just kind of think about one more way to work this illustration, okay? And that is this, with the 12 youth. The 12 youth, they're like nitrogen. They're like nitrogen. Youth make a church green. They do. Youth make us green. When the kids were in here earlier walking up and down the, the middle and over to the side, it just says there's life here. You know, greenery. I walk on the trail in the winter, there's nothing. Just a few evergreens, but nothing otherwise. I walk out there this morning, it's gorgeous. The rabbits are on the move. The, 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 I saw a deer the other day. The trees are, the cardinals, are, all the birds are just going, they're excited. Youth bring greenery. I love, I'm having more fun with this illustration, even as I preach it. Youth bring green. They bring, they bring hope into the life of the church. And that was the first thing it says here, this idea of hope, to rejoice in hope. Youth bring hope. I watched graduation on Sunday, Friday night on, on WHS Network, and I just was so excited when each of those youth crossed that platform. They bring us hope. Now, the next one is this, mentors. They're like phosphate. Okay, they help mentors help the roots grow deep. Isn't that good? Up until just a couple hundred years ago, wh whatever your, your take is on history, whether it's like five to 7,000 years or millions of years, up until just a couple hundred years ago, there was no such thing as public education. And there were no universities, colleges. Mentors were the people that helped the next generation learn about raising a family, how to read, how to work, how to socially interact. Mentors were the ones that helped the roots grow deep. Isn't this a great illustration? I was sharing this with a friend of mine. I said, did you get that or did you borrow that from somebody else? I, I got that. I got, I'll just give the Lord credit. Helping the roots grow deep. We need to be there, mentors. It's more than the responsibility of teachers and administrators. And I was raised in a home with a teacher and an administrator on either side of the dinner table. I understand the school. I was, I, I, I was born on the night of a school event, a basketball game. I've been in school my whole life. But the story is this, mentors help the roots grow deep. And the third thing is this, people praying. People praying. They are a covering. And they are helping that when the youth, when times get tough, that third thing it said there was to be constant in prayer. They are continually praying always. To be constant in prayer, it helps the grass, it helps the youth to withstand the troubles in life. Does that make sense? Are you, are you liking this today? I'm not asking for credit. I'm asking for a response, you know? Because the only way I know this sermon will really mean what it means is in a year from now, in five years from now, in 10 years from now, We'll see guys and ladies who are doing just like a couple that's in our church today, Pastor Dan and Erica, were in the youth group here. I look back in the sound booth. There's Brent. He was in the youth group. There's Taylor. She was in the youth group. McCorbin is now in the youth group. 
others that have served in the life of the church, others that have been raised up. Pastor Courtney, who's on the district now, Pastor Mark Hendrickson, his wife Stephanie, co-pastors, they, they were part of this youth group. It's a huge thing. I just started listing all these things. Ross Reynolds, Kane Pretty, Kim Allred, Erica, Sarah, Amber Hummel, Kyle Thompson. What a strong Christian man Kyle is these days. Josh Kaufman. One of the top 15, 15, we had the banquet form a couple of weeks ago. Josh Kaufman was one of the 15 mentors that was recognized. It was, man, Josh grew up right here in this youth group. Isn't that neat? And it was so neat to think about this. This kid that honored him as the, one of the top 15 students, Caleb Henderson. Caleb is this tall, lanky basketball player. Caleb is this on-the-field baseball player. Caleb only took up soccer his 10th grade year. Just, I don't know why, just maybe he wanted to try it. And who was his mentor? His soccer coach. His soccer coach, Josh Kaufman. Corey and Lindy Thomas, our daughters. I've already talked about Kayla. And Laura Stoops and Martina Stoops are now graduated. And so many other kids have come up through this youth group. And you know what I think? Um, no. You know what I know? I know that we are on the edge of the Jordan right now. I know that we are ready to step into the promised land. God has prepared the way. There are at least a dozen mentors and at least a dozen prayer people and at least a dozen youth. Pastor Dan and I sat down two weeks ago. We started talking about this, and it just the names just came. And we were like 15, 20, 25 youth immediately that could be part of the original 12. Isn't it amazing what Jesus did with 12 just think what Harris Chapel can do to change this world with 12. I am just enough of a person to believe that it's not going to happen when it's man, not mandated, when it's helped out, implemented, a special program comes from Washington, D.C., from Indianapolis, from Muncie, county, seat, state, national. It's not going to change the world. Though, those things have never, programs from those entities have never changed the world. They've never changed. What has changed the world is people. What has changed the world is people that have a, a passion inside that says, you know what, more than anything, I want to see kids, I want to see youth come to Jesus, and I want to see what God's going to do with their life. The list goes on and on. These are just a few that came to mind just the other day. I'd like you to stand with me this morning, and let's bow our heads in prayer, and then I want to invite you. And everybody is welcome to do this after we pray. Everybody's welcome. Whether you're a youth or whether you want to be a mentor, you say, Jim, what does that job description look like? I can just tell you it's so simple. Just show up and love on teens. Pastor Dan and I are more excited than you can even imagine about what that future looks like for our youth at Harris Chapel. And then maybe you're check mark as many well i can't get there because i'm not able to drive i don't go out after night and the activities are just too much for me but i can sure pray let's pray father we're ready we're we're there we're we're seeing and, and lord we've had so many times as you have helped us in these years we've had so many experiences the kids that i thought about some of these kids have been on mission trips to one heart many hands in indianapolis and and one heart many hands over in ohio and, and they've been part of a mission trip to mississippi and they were part of a mission trip to alaska and father these kids have also been some of them have been to monterey mexico on encuentro and they've served in these different places lord this is a new day and we're more excited than ever about what you want to do in the hearts and lives of youth mentors and prayer warriors at Harris Chapel. Help us, we pray, to respond, to pick up these stones. And I pray there's a there's hundred of them here. Lord, if they're all gone, that's fine. We may not even have that many here today. That's okay. But we're stepping up because, Lord, we want to see your kingdom come and your will be done in this town, in this church, in this county, in this state, in this country, in this God-created, God-ordained, and really still maintained by God world. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name.
this morning. I appreciate you, Greg, coming to pray. Anybody else want to just come and pray as well? That's good. We can make this a prayer time first. If you have a prayer need, I know we want to continue to pray for Sally Hayden. We want to continue to pray for Kay Whitehead and Idola Pokes and others. What a blessing and miracle to see Randy Knuckles here last Sunday. Had heart surgery or back surgery early last week, and he's in church. He's here again today. I just know there are so many needs, and I don't, you you know those needs. You can come and pray about them, please. Maybe you want to just come and start the, start the, the movement by saying, you know what, I'm here to pray for our youth. I'm here to pray for our kids. These, this week is Vacation Bible School, and I just want to pray for our kids. I want to pray for visitors that will be here. I want to pray for kids that our kids will minister to as they go out to, to play ball this summer and get ready to go back to school in August and all those different things that are happening. Help us. Help us, Lord. This is the real thing. This is the real thing. Lord, minister these needs around the altar, these ones that we mentioned by name and others that have needs today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are faithful. It just got me to read that one more time in Joshua chapter 1. I will go with you. Wherever you put your foot, I will be there. That is amazing. And the whole story that unfolds in Joshua 4 is just is amazing. Help us, I pray, Lord, to be your hands, to be your feet, to be your mouthpiece, to be watching, to be listening. Not just to be available, Lord, but to get in. Not just to watch, but to get engaged. Help us, I pray, Jesus. Help us, I pray. We're still in an attitude of prayer. and I just want to invite you this morning. Youth, I want to invite you to come and pick up a stone. People that want to be mentors, come and pick up a stone. People that are going to pray, come and pick up a stone. Let's clear these stones out. Would you join me? I've already got mine. Mine says blessed. Just find a stone and pick it up, and then you can go back to your seat. If you want to pause and pray, that's fine. But I just pray that we truly be like those Israelites. As they were getting ready to get into the promised land, they grabbed one of those stones, and they were reminders. I've already got one of these. I picked it up years ago at Cracker Barrel. It says freedom on it. It's in the dash of my pickup truck. The one I picked up today says bless. Youth, adults, just grab one. And if you want to pledge yourself as a mentor, if you want to pledge yourself as a prayer warrior, or youth just want to step in and say, I'm going to be one of the 12. And isn't it amazing, one more time before we transition, how Jesus changed the world with 12. How he changed the world with 12. Father, as these stones are being picked up, I just pray that we are not just thinking about this or talking about this on the 6th of June. But Father, this is truly one of those moments that we cross over into what you want to do over the next five years, 10 years, 25 years, however long you tarry until you come back, that we will be faithfully engaging, immersing ourselves into the lives of children and youth. And youth will be immersing themselves into their community. And again, Lord, your kingdom will come. I feel like to close this prayer time, we just need to say that prayer together, the Lord's Prayer. Would you join me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And remember this, that if we're asking, if we're asking for bread, he's not going to give us a stone. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, after we're done here, as soon as we're done, Case is going to come lead us in our closing song, and I think Trish is helping, and others are helping. Uh, after we're done, I'm going to invite anybody that wants to stay. Come on up, brother. Anybody that wants to stay and find out more about the future, we're talking about youth, we're talking about Sunday school, we're talking about home groups, we're going to just meet right over here about where Jeanette and, and Shirley are just right in this area, okay? So uh, right after that, brother, you can close us with prayer after this last song, please. Thank you.
for the thoughts. Because he lives. And then one day I'll cross over that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and know he lives. Thank you, Lorraine.